Okay, this is Mel Astran for IOF TV News, and I'm here at the IOF Educational Seminar in Reno, Nevada, and I'm speaking with Dave Rosenberg, Good to the see you Grand again, Master Matt. of California, and one of the speakers here, his fabulous speech on parliamentary procedure yesterday. You'll see that as an episode on IOF TV very soon. So now, tell me, Dave, how many years have you been coming to these seminars? You know, I've been coming for uh, three or four years off and on. Uh, the prior seminars were always in uh, Santanella. Santanella, beautiful Santanella, kind of a bend in the road. And uh, this is the first year we've done uh, Reno. Uh, Deputy uh, Grandmaster Pete Sellers uh, asked me about moving it to Reno. I said, sounds good. We, we did it, and the rest at, is history. We've got the greatest the turnout. turnout ever. It's terrific. And uh, it, the, uh, the various speakers have all done a pretty, pretty good job. Um, people we've we've had some good people, and uh, they presented a lot of information. I guarantee you, nobody's leaving the seminar without some knowledge. I'd like to introduce our Grand Master of California, Dave Rosenberg. Good morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me? No. No. You want to turn the mic on? Here we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? No. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to see all of you. I think some of you are still in the restroom. Yeah. Okay. Because um, we only have three quarters of the seats filled at this point. But we'll proceed. First of all, first of all, I want to say that we do have a great turnout at this event. Um, Peter Sellers mentioned to me many months ago that uh, he'd like to move away from Santanella and move uh, to have this seminar in Reno. And I said to him, great idea, let's do it. And it's gone beyond our wildest expectations. I believe that this will become a new tradition for California Oddfellows, and I hope to see the Reno Membership Seminar for many, many years to come. And you are here at the beginning. You're the charter members of the new Reno Seminar. I want to thank Peter Sellers, wonderful job. Um, I want to thank uh, Ron Perry, wonderful job, and Don Lang. The three of them will be instigators, motivators, and the people who made this happen. So it's wonderful. Uh, I also want to mention that six of my seven Grand Lodge officers are here. I'm delighted that they're here. I'd like to recognize them. Uh, Grand Marshal uh, Nancy Johnson, best Grand Marshal in the history of our fellowship. <laughs> Grand Chapel Reader Cooper, you're going to hear from her a little later. The Grand Corps Bear of Stark de Gess is here. Grand Guardian Leo Rosenberg. The Grand Herald, Anita Dunnell, is here. Yeah. And our great instructor, Neil Allen, is present. By the way, Neil is back there with my books. Uh, you can't see him, but there's a post here. Uh, he got an inexpensive seat. Uh, and he has both my books available. I don't sell pins and buttons. I sell books, and the money, I don't get the money. The money goes to Grand Lodge, Grand Lodge Endeavors. So the books are useful. You might want to take a look at them. I also want to recognize uh, Grand Warden Dave Reed is here. Dave, are you? I guess Dave's still in the restroom. And uh, Grand Secretary Ray Link is there. And Grand Treasurer Jay Johnson. So wonderful turnout for Ray Lodge office. So by the way, Ray's newly elected uh, no grand Take a turn. This year is over. Raise your hand. What? Okay, glad to see you here. All right. No, you're, you're up as the yeah, you were elected. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did, you said raise your hand. <laughs> so, let, uh, by the way, I'm going to talk about uh, parliamentary procedure. But before I do, uh, one thing that uh, I'm, I'm real pleased to have heard is uh, Ron mentioned, he said, what does uh, Ray Link uh, consider the number one issue or problem? 
and, and I understand these issues about corporation insurance. Those are issues, no question about it. But when he asked you that question, I heard virtually every voice say membership. Yeah. And I agree. And it's delightful for me to understand that all of you agree, that that word has filtered down to everyone, that that is our number one concern, because if we do not increase membership, we're done as an order. Uh, we'll go the way of hundreds of other orders. I don't want to see that happen. So membership is the number one issue for us. Parliamentary procedure. I'm going to talk to you about the basic rules of parliamentary procedure. These are the rules that you'll find in Robert's Rules of Order, uh, in Rosenberg's Rules of Order. Uh, these are the basic rules. Uh, they may not completely comport with other rules you've seen, but these are the rules that apply across the board a, a generally established parliamentary procedure. How did I get involved with parliamentary procedure to begin with? Uh, I used to be a mayor. <clears throat> I was the mayor of the city of Davis, uh, twice actually, and I was a chairman of our county board of supervisors. And when I was mayor many, many years ago, this was probably uh, 25 years ago or longer, uh, I uh, set up a seminar for all our boards and commissions. I wanted the chairs and the vice chairs to attend. I wanted them to become very user-friendly, very public-friendly. So I presented parliamentary procedure. I explained to them how to run a meeting and how to do it so that it's user-friendly and public-friendly. Uh, I did that for a couple of years. After a couple of years, I started getting attendance from other cities. Other cities would send their boards and commissions. One year I was unable to do that, and so I uh, wrote it down. I put it in written form uh, so we could pass it out. And that became the uh, genesis of Roosevelt's Rules of Order. I have taught this class many, many times to uh, mayors and city council members, members of boards of supervisors, many other people have taken this class. Uh, I have found, and by the way, I did write a document called Rosenberg's Rules of Order. You can find this on the internet. Uh, the League of California Cities sells it in a pocket format. Uh, it is not inconsistent with Robert's Rules of Order. The difference is the following. How many of you have actually read, be honest, Act of Love and Truth? How many of you have actually read Robert's Rules of Order? Raise your hand. How many of you understand it? <laughs> so you say. So, uh, I found that virtually no one has ever read it. When I ask that question of mayors, I get two hands that go up. Uh, it's too long, it's too cumbersome, it's too bulky. It's wonderful for parliament, large bodies, but it doesn't work so well for smaller bodies. So I developed Rosenberg's Rules of Order, which are not inconsistent with Robert's, but you can read them in 20 minutes. 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, some of you may be 40 minutes. But uh, you can read them quickly. And you can understand them. And so that's what it's all about. Uh, not inconsistent. It explains how to run a meeting. So with that uh, said, uh, and by the way, Rosenberg's Rules of Order, much to my surprise, have now been adopted throughout the United States uh, in lieu of Robert's Rules of Order by hundreds and hundreds of cities, counties, commissions, boards, corporations, special districts, it shows, you, it shows you the power of the internet because people can get it on the internet, they have adopted it. So, I'm going to do a little self-test, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then we're going to get right into it. And, and we'll, we'll approach this as if you were members of a city council. Uh, you're at a city council, you are a city council member, you're at a meeting of your city council, and you can't hear the discussion due to noise being made by an old heating system. Should, you should raise your hand and when recognized, state, point of order, I can't hear what's being discussed. Who thinks that's true? Who thinks that's false? Who doesn't know? Okay. Actually, it's false. Uh, this is called a, it's not a point of order, it's a point of personal privilege. You have a voucher for me? Well, thank you. I did. Thank you. This is called point of personal privilege. If you can't hear something or you can't see something, you may stand up and announce point of personal privilege, I can't hear. 
or I can't see or whatever. Now, here's another question for you. At, in the middle of the meeting, you're in the middle of a meeting, and Xenophobia, a member of the city council, that's her name, is recognized by the mayor and moves to adjourn the meeting. Her motion is seconded by Frank. The mayor asks for discussion prior to the vote. Xenophobia raises a point of order. This is a point of order, not a point of personal privilege, and says the motion should be voted on immediately. Who is correct? Who thinks the mayor is correct? Who thinks xenophobia is correct? Who doesn't know? Who doesn't know has it? Xenophobia is correct. A motion to adjourn is not debatable. Must be voted on immediately. These are the things you're going to learn in this presentation. All right, I have many more questions, but I think we need to launch into the presentation because we have uh, limited time. So, what are you going to learn? What? I don't know what you're looking at. Don't look at the manual. We're not in the manual. This is the PowerPoint. Okay, I don't know what the manual has. This is a PowerPoint on parliamentary procedure. Okay, so you might want to look at the PowerPoint. So as a result of this particular class, you're not going to feel overwhelmed by the complexities of parliamentary procedure. You will feel at home as an active participant in your meeting. And if you will, are chairing, you will feel comfortable chairing the meeting. So what's parliamentary procedure all about? It's about rules. And what's the purpose of rules? We have the, it's on the PowerPoint for you. Number one, rules should establish order. Because if you do not, do not have order, what do you have? Chaos. Chaos. So you got to have order. Number two, rules should be clear. Uh, everyone should understand the rules. I found that the biggest single problem in meetings is when some people understand the rules or think they understand the rules and they kind of run the show and other people don't really understand the rules. And if that happens, you have two classes of people at the meeting. One class that dominates because they know what the rules are and another class that feels they can't participate because they don't know how to do things. And that's what we want to avoid. We want everyone to understand the rules. <laughs> Next, rules should be user friendly. They've got to be simple enough that people can understand them. That's why I wrote Rosenberg's Rules of Order. By the way, if you go to the internet, you don't have to buy these rules. Go to the internet, go to Google, type in Rosenberg's Rules of Order, they will pop up and you can print them out. You can read them in 20 or 30 minutes. So they should be user friendly. And finally, and really most importantly, rules need to enforce the will of the majority while protecting the rights of the minority. This is a very important feature of parliamentary procedure. Ultimately, we are a democratic organization. And so ultimately, when things are disputed, the majority must win. But you must protect the rights of the minority to be heard to discuss things when appropriate, and to maybe change people's minds. So, moving on. What's the role of the chair? The role of the chair, whoever the chair is, could be a president, could be a mayor, could be a grandmaster. <coughs> the chair must understand the rules. The chair really needs to understand the rules kind of better than anyone, right? Because ultimately it's the chair that makes the decisions on the rules. It's important that the chair move the meeting and the agenda. That's really a key role. Have you ever been in a meeting that just drags on? This includes noble lands. Just drags on. Move the meeting. Don't stumble around in the agenda. Don't try to find where you are on the agenda. Know where you are and move it. Obviously, fairly, you want people to understand and have their say, but you need to move it along. I believe the chair has to take the lead role in process. The substantive discussion belongs to the body, whether it's your lodge meeting, grand lodge meeting, a committee meeting, it's the members that must be involved in the substance of it. The chair is involved in the process, making sure it's efficient and fair. And in my opinion, the chair has to take a less active 
role in the debate. In most organizations, the chair should speak last. That's a very strong and important role. In Odd Fellows, we tend not to take a role. Uh, noble brands, grandmasters tend not to speak to the subject. Uh, I may take exception to that and may speak on the subject from time to time at the conclusion of the debate. Uh, and you should feel free to do that as well uh, as a noble brand. But let everyone have their say before you do. Now, let's talk about the basic format for an agenda item. You will find in your charge books a agenda, right? You all know where that is in the charge book. In your little red book, uh, there is an agenda, page 11 or 12 or something like that. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, is merely a suggestion. Do not feel bound by that agenda. You develop your own agenda that works. You're not bound by that. So whatever works for your lodge, that, that's what you do. Now, it's important uh, when you do an agenda, number one, announce the agenda. What's the item you're talking about? For example, we're now going to go into committee reports. And we're now going to have a committee report from the bylaws committee. Tell everyone where we are. Don't assume they know. Next, we take a report on the item. The, the committee will report. Uh, next, we often typically ask, are there any questions of clarification? Anybody need to know anything they didn't understand in this report? Next, well, we're not in a public meeting like the city council, so you don't need public comments. Uh, normally, I invite a motion. It's always, in my opinion, better to have a motion on the floor before you open discussion. Uh, if you have a motion on the floor, then you know what you're discussing. If you don't have a motion on the floor, you have an amorphous discussion. So I typically ask for a motion. Uh, there will be rare occasions when you, you really need to have a discussion before someone can frame a motion. I think that's a rare occasion. So you ask for a motion. And how do we make a motion? You don't stand up and say, I motion. Uh, you, you don't stand up and say, I make a motion, because that's what you're doing. You say, I make a motion, or I move. I move, is what you say. I move, such and such. So you stand up, you recognize, and you say, Noble Grand, I move that we adopt the committee report. Then, you need a second. Someone needs to second it. Noble Brand, I second the motion. Then you must make sure everyone understands the motion. We often go into a vote without understanding the motion. Don't do that. It's your job as Grand Master or Noble Brand or whatever committee chair to make sure everyone knows what you are voting on. Critically important. So there are three ways to do it. One, if you're a noble brand, you state the motion. The motion on the floor is to adopt the committee report. Or the motion on the floor is to appoint a committee of three to investigate uh, having a party on New Year's. Whatever. State the motion. Another way to do it is to have the maker of the motion state the motion. Okay? The third way is to ask the secretary to state the motion. But however you do it, make sure everyone understands what the motion is. After you've stated the motion, you go into discussion and debate. Then you say, is there any discussion on the motion? Now, you open it up, people can discuss it. If, as you look around, no one raises their hand, you can take the next step, which is the vote, which we'll get to momentarily. Uh, but let people discuss it. Don't let one person dominate the discussion. Uh, don't let anyone speak more than twice on the motion. Uh, and make sure everyone has a chance to speak to it. Look around. Let people speak uh, who want to speak. Invite them to speak. Uh, after the discussion, if you're sure that uh, everyone understands and is ready to go, there's no more discussion. 
you, you look around, it's clear, then you say, okay, we're going to take the vote. At that point, and by the way, if there's been a lot of discussion, it's okay to restate the motion, just to remind people what you're voting on. Now, have you all heard in meetings people yelling out question, or I call the question? Yes. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, as noble grand or as grandmaster, if someone says question, I will interpret that to mean that you would like to vote on it. And I will look around to see if anyone wishes to discuss further. Because calling the question means you want to stop debate and vote. So just because someone calls the question, I'm not going to stop the debate. I'm going to look around to see if people still want to discuss it. The official motion to stop debate is, raise your hand, you recognize, Noble Grand, I move the previous question. I move the previous question is a fancy parliamentary procedure way of saying, Noble Rand, I move that we stop debate. And I will get to that momentarily. I'll explain how that motion is handled, because it's a special motion with special rules. So uh, if you're ready to vote, you take the vote. You can vote in many ways. Typically, uh, you vote in the formal uh, way, and then you count the votes. And then finally, and most importantly, wait for it, wait for it, here it comes. You announce the result. Tell people what happened. I, I go to many meetings where no one says what happened. Tell them what you just did. So you explain to the body, we just passed the following motion, done, and move on. I'm going to skip over these hypotheticals. Okay, we've got lots of hypotheticals we're going to skip over. Uh, counting abstained votes. We don't really have abstained votes in the Odd Fellows. So uh, let me talk just a moment about motions. There are basically three basic motions, three motions. Motion number one is the basic motion. I'll give you an example. I move that we appoint a committee of three members to do an audit. Basic motion. <coughs> Okay. Another kind of motion is a motion to amend. After someone has made a, a basic motion, someone may stand up and make a motion to amend. Uh, for example, I move an amendment. I move that we have uh, a committee of five to do the audit. So that motion takes the same basic motion and changes it in some way. The basic motion was, we're going to have a committee of three to do the audit. The motion to amend would have a committee of five. It's simply, I move to amend to have a committee of five. Uh, hold your question. If After I'm done, write it down. Uh, and then at the end, we'll uh, deal with any questions. And then finally, the third type is the substitute motion. The motion to amend and the substitute motion are very different. I'll give you an example of a substitute motion. Uh, no grant, I move that we uh, select a CPA to do the audit. Now, that's a substitute motion. By the way, it's the no grant or the grand master or the committee chair that makes the determination whether it's a motion to amend or a substitute motion. A substitute motion is a motion that, if passed, completely supersedes the original basic motion. So let me explain how that works. You may actually have all three motions on the floor. You may have a basic motion, a motion to amend, and a substitute motion. If you have that, the first thing you deal with is a substitute motion. Typically, you vote on the last motion first. So in this case, you vote on the substitute motion to have a CPA. If that passes, if the motion to have a CPA do the audit passes, what happens to the motion to amend and the basic motion? They go away. You never deal with them. Done. <coughs> substitute motion passes, it's done. If the substitute motion fails, what happens? You go to the motion to amend. 
because they're still valid and viable. If the motion to amend fails, go to the basic motion. If the motion to amend passes, what do you do? You go to the basic motion as amended. You still have to vote on the basic motion as now amended. Okay? So let's move on. This rule applies everywhere. Now, to debate or not to debate, this is important. Here's the basic rule on motions. All motions are subject to debate or discussion. That's the rule. There are, of course, exceptions. Here they are. A motion to adjourn is not debatable. Remember the one uh, question I asked you in the beginning? If, some, if Leah moves to adjourn the meeting, and Janice seconds that motion, is that debatable? No. The chair, noble grand, grandmaster, immediately must call for a vote. So, all those in favor of adjourning, raise both hands. All opposed, raise both hands. Gee, we're adjourned. No. Uh, so, if it passes, the meeting's adjourned. That's it. Done. So, uh, other exceptions, a motion to take a recess, rarely done. Usually, if you need a recess, the noble grand, whoever, takes a recess. Uh, motion to fix the time to adjourn. This happens sometimes. I used to be at meetings that went till 2 in the morning. And so, early in the meeting, someone would move that we adjourn the meeting at 12 midnight. If that passes, that's what happens. When we hit 12 midnight, the meeting adjourns. These are not, de not debatable. Um, oops, sorry. A motion to table. Very, very powerful motion. Very powerful. If uh, you move to table and it's seconded, it's not debatable. If it passes, the item is tabled. Now, there's two kinds of motions to table. You can just move to table, in which case, to take the item back on the table for discussion, you have to make a motion to bring it back. Or you can move to table to a specific time. I move we table this item to our next meeting. If that passes, the item is tabled to the next meeting. And finally, a motion to limit debate. That, by the way, is I move the previous question. I move the previous question. That is a motion to uh, cut off all debate. But you could also move to limit debate to the next five minutes or in some other fashion. Now, here, supermajority votes. Here's the basic rule. All motions require a simple majority to pass. Now, there are going to be some rules laid out in bylaws or in Robert's Code that affect the odd fellows that require super majorities, two thirds majorities or three fourths majorities to do certain things. These are the basic rules of parliamentary procedure. There are exceptions to the, uh, uh, to the basic rule. And these exceptions require a two thirds vote. The motion to limit debate. I moved the previous question. I told you earlier it's not debatable, but it also requires a two thirds vote to pass. And that makes sense. You don't want to cut people off unless a supermajority wants to do so. So, motion to cut off debate. I move the previous question. Two thirds vote. A motion to close nominations. Nominations are open unless you move to close them. Two thirds vote. A motion to object to consideration of a question and a motion to suspend the rules requires a supermajority, two thirds vote. What else? A motion to reconsider. Uh, this is a special motion and it, require, and it has special rules. It's a simple majority needed to pass it, but it must be made at a certain time and can only be made by certain members. Let me explain what this means. Let's assume you have a committee of nine members and um, you pass something, you, may, you take an action, the vote is five to four. It's five to four. Later in the meeting, uh, one of the members of the majority uh, has a change of heart. They can make a motion to reconsider. A member of the minority cannot do that. 
if it's a five to four vote, a member of the five can make a motion to reconsider. A member of the four minority cannot. If the rule were otherwise, the losing group could bring it back again and again and again. And that's not permitted. So if a member of the majority has a change of heart, wants to change their mind, or wants to discuss it again, they can make a motion to reconsider at the same meeting, later in the meeting. Anyone can second that motion. Either the majority or minority members can second it. If the motion to reconsider passes, motion to reconsider passes like five to four, the item is back on the agenda as if for the first time. And it's dealt with and discussed and voted on as if uh, the first time. So, finally, let's wrap it up and then I think we may have time for a few questions. Uh, what's it all about? Courtesy and decorum. Let's not forget friendship, love, and truth. Let's not have a lot of backbiting, discord, we have to create the right atmosphere, and that really, to a large measure, is up to the noble grand, grandmaster, or whoever is chairing. It's important that one person speak at a time. That's why uh, standing up and being recognized is really important. And let's maintain a certain formality. Stand up, be recognized, address the chair as noble grand. The chair recognizes you and you speak. Uh, feel free to raise a point of privilege if you can't hear or can't see. Uh, that's okay. A point of order, uh, if uh, you think something was done that's wrong, you may raise a point of order. Now, here's an important point. The person sharing the meeting, whether it be the noble grand or the grand master or whoever, makes the final ruling on issues of process or parliamentary procedure. That person is the decision maker, or as a former president used to say, the decider. That person makes the call subject only to being overruled by the body. You can make a motion to appeal the ruling of the chair. You can make a motion to appeal the ruling of the chair. If the noble grand or the grand master whoever makes a decision, you don't agree with it, you think he or she is wrong, you can move to appeal the ruling of the chair. It's seconded, it's discussed. If the body votes on it and the majority of votes to appeal the ruling, that the ruling of the chair is overturned. But short of that, the ruling of the chair is final. And let's talk about withdrawing a motion. Um, once you've made a motion, you can withdraw it at any time. Until the moment that the uh, chair announces the motion for the vote. At the moment the chair announces the motion to be voted on, by the body, you no longer may withdraw your motion. Then the motion belongs to the body. It belongs to the body, and you can't withdraw it. Up to that point, you can withdraw your motion. Um, you all know about friendly amendments. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful tool. Let's assume uh, that Jeff makes a motion. Uh, it's seconded by Jean Paul. And you're discussing it, and in the course of the discussion, uh, you know, Duff raises some points that make sense. He doesn't have to make a motion to amend if the maker of the original motion decides to incorporate ideas that Duff has mentioned in his original motion and accepts it as a friendly amendment and the seconder agrees. Then we have a new motion on the floor. You don't have to go through the formality of voting on an amendment. The maker of the motion has accepted that suggestion and it's called a friendly amendment. And again, it's important that the no grant announce before the vote what you're voting on. It's a very useful tool to move things along. Okay? Now, public input, this applies to the members of the body as well. Rule number one, tell everyone what you're doing. Number two, keep everyone informed while you're doing it. This is the role of the noble grand, grandmaster, whoever's chairing the meeting. Let everyone know what you're doing. And finally, rule number three, when you've acted, tell everyone what you've done. So uh, here's the final conclusion, then we'll open it up to questions. Please pay close attention. It took me a lot of time to do this. Can you go back to the last one? Yeah, we'll go back. I want you to watch this. It took a great deal of effort.
All right, uh, we have a, a couple questions. We well, have yeah, uh, on the board. You want to answer them now? Uh, sure. Uh, there was one hand raised earlier. You want to ask your question? I answered it. Okay. okay. So we have a question. Yes. I have one exception on the abstentions. Yeah. If there's a possibility of a conflict of interest, I'm sorry, Jack, one more, you have a point of Allow the move for us. Okay. If there is going to be a conflict of interest, for example, personally, anything with audiovisual or video conferencing or even Skype, I have to, I would have to abstain from any vote. Because it's because of, my, because of my professional responsibilities. Are you saying if there's a conflict of interest? Yeah, you would, you have to. I, my feeling is you have to be, be you have to abstain, and it has to be in the minutes. That's fine. Yeah, if you have a conflict of interest, obviously do not vote on the subject. You have to. Uh, and when you abstain, uh, you should. You, it's more than abstaining. You cannot participate. You cannot participate in the discussion. You cannot participate in the vote. You cannot be involved in any way, shape, or form uh, if there's a conflict of interest. In fact, uh, one would argue you should leave the room so no one can even see your demeanor. But uh, don't participate if you have a conflict. Yes, you had a question up here. Do you want to do the paper first, though? The poop. Uh, yeah, the paper. No, go ahead. Ask the question. Okay, uh, so can the maker of a motion vote against his own motion? The yeah. maker of the motion can absolutely vote against his or her own motion. I have done that many times. I have, yeah, I'm sure Peter has uh, often, in fact, on virtually every motion we make to vote against it. Uh, the maker of the motion, sometimes I move something or second something simply to put it out there and have a vote. You absolutely can vote against it. Okay. And you can, you can discuss an item and speak against it and then vote for it. Whatever you want. It's perfectly okay. Yes, sir. Um, it's bad on seconding the motion. The seconding? Yeah, it doesn't mean that you support it. You just... Yeah. Along the same lines, you can second a motion even though you don't support it. In fact, you can say that. Uh, I am uh, going to second this motion. You can even say, I'm, I've done this before. I'm giving a courtesy second because so-and-so is out of the room. You can second a motion and say that you don't support it the uh, motion, but you want to second it so we can put it out there, have a discussion and vote. That's correct. Yes? If the motion has been withdrawn, can it be reopened in yes. future meetings? The maker of the motion can withdraw his or her motion. And then when that happens, I, I often ask the seconder, do you wish to make that motion? The maker of the motion is withdrawn. I ask the person who seconded it, do you wish to make that motion? If they say yes, I ask, is there a second? And then we move on. So just because a person withdraws their motion doesn't mean that someone else can't make it. Okay, so here's a few of the questions from the floor. Is it an absolute requirement to have the noble brand to restate the motion prior to voting? Is it an absolute requirement? In my book, yes. Do you find that in parliamentary procedure rules written anywhere? Probably not, but it's common sense. Uh, you don't want to have a vote when the members don't completely understand what they're voting on. Sometimes in the course of discussion, things get very confused and muddled. Sometimes the motion morphs, particularly when the maker accepts a friendly amendment. It's very important for the noble brand for the chair to state precisely what the motion is that you're voting on. Okay? Here's another question. What did the twin speaker... That was mine. What? I'm sorry. Uh, that was my question. I just wanted to... Because you, were, you had stated that you could have the maker of the motion restate the motion instead of... I, I found it difficult. It was a very long motion. If I didn't make as Noble Brand to actually state the motion. Can I have the, the motion maker restate the, the, the long-winded motion? Is that appropriate? There are three ways. There are three ways that you can do this. One is the Noble Brand can state the motion. And if there's disagreement, the maker thinks you can state it right, then you have to deal with it. Two, the Noble Brand can ask the maker to state the motion. Three, in many ways, the third method is the best. 
You can have the secretary state the motion. Because, brothers and sisters, whatever the secretary has in his or her minutes is what you're voting on. If you're looking at it in the future, it's what the minutes say. So if the secretary doesn't have it down correctly, there's a problem. Now, if you get a long-winded motion, it's probably good for the noble grand to state the motion clearly to make sure the secretary has it written down correctly. Uh, okay, let me move on to another question. What did the quiz speaker say we could not vote against? Or did I misunderstand? Uh, where is Ron? What, what did the quiz speaker say we could not vote against? We'll come back. What did the quiz speaker say we could not vote against? It was in his illustration about um, two people voted uh, against something that four others voted for, and I wasn't sure whether it had to do with the Noble Grand can't ask them why they voted against, oh, oh, or, okay, okay. or that they couldn't <coughs> vote against it's, because it's, everybody voted. It's something. none of the Noble Grand's business or anybody's business why you voted yes or no on anything. That's your business. You don't have to explain your vote anytime. Anyone who asks you to tell you why you voted that way is out of order. Yes, sir? How do you properly break a tie? Okay, first of all, you have to make sure there is, in fact, a tie. If there is a tie vote, in, in uh, this order, uh, noble grands and grandmasters do not vote normally. I think it's a silly rule, but that's the rule that's been established over time. So the tie will then be broken by the noble grand and the grandmaster. Because at that point, they do get to vote. Okay. And uh, let's see, I had one more question, or two more questions. Must a member making a point of order or privilege or a motion be recognized by the grandmaster for the motion to be on the floor? Uh, motions must be recognized by the grandmaster or the noble grand. So if you wish to say something, uh, say, Mark, let's assume you want to say something. You have to stand up. Go ahead, stand up. Mark Donnell. No, you don't say anything. <laughs> and I recognize you. I'm Mark Donnell, a chaplain at Berkeley 270. Uh, and oh, I see that now. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I recognize you. Uh, the, the exceptions are a point of personal privilege and point of order. If Mark believes I've done something wrong, he may stand up and immediately say, point of order. Go ahead, Mark. Point of order. And then I recognize him. And he can do that while something's going on. He can do that. Or if he wants to raise a point of personal privilege, like I can't hear or I can't see, he can stand up and say, point of personal privilege. Go ahead. Point of personal privilege. Please speak into the microphone. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Point of personal privilege. Yes, Paul. The questions that are being proposed by the audience, you need to repeat because... I will do so. Thank and you. That is a very valid point. Uh, Grand Marshal, would you escort uh, Paul out to the place? He's <laughs> been terribly disruptive. Here he comes. Uh, uh, Jay Johnson, the Grand, uh, Grand Treasurer. You move to what? Limit debate? For another two minutes. Okay. It's been moved that we limit the discussion to two more minutes. Is there a second? Second. 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 Uh, there's no discussion on that motion. <laughs> All those in favor, raise both hands. Uh, <laughs> All, All those opposed, uh, raise both hands. Motion carries overwhelmingly, and we're going to cut this off in two minutes. So there is a motion. Good job, everyone. Uh, it says reconsider versus rescind a motion. Uh, there's no such thing as rescinding a motion. If a motion is passed, it's passed. Uh, if a member of the majority wants to reconsider, they can make a motion to reconsider. If the motion to reconsider is passed, then the item is back on the floor. Uh, any final questions before we turn this over? Yes, sir. Is there a possibility with the people here running 
uh, running the setup that they could have a hand or two wireless microphones. So if somebody wants to ask a question, there's no problem of Which hearing. Questions on the board. Yeah, but like he's asking uh, people the if they want. Question was: Can we have two wireless mics and put that on the board, and that will be dealt with? That's a very uh, good question. Last question. Uh, can you make a, a point of personal order to, if you're not understanding something in the discussion? Uh, can you make a point of what? A, a, a point of personal preference. Okay, it's a point of personal privilege or a point of order. And so, what is the question? The question is, if during the discussion you're missing, you don't understand the, the, the points that are being made. Ah, okay, thank you. No, you can't. Uh, that was Bill. Uh, you you can't uh, make a you can't say point of personal privilege because you you are. Uh, you can't follow what's going on because you don't understand what's going on. That's your problem. Okay? Uh, you can stand up during the debate, be recognized, and say, I don't understand. Uh, could you please explain? But you can't say, point of personal privilege, I'm, I'm too stupid, I don't get it. <laughs> now, I take that back, Bill. In your case, we'll give you permission to do that. All right. All right, I'm sorry, I, I wish, I know when I do this in other uh, bodies, we, we, these take an hour, an hour and a half. We have many questions of parliamentary procedure. There may be time tomorrow to deal with that, but we do need to move on. Thank you for your kind attention.